Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Oracle Open World 2016. Brought to you by Oracle. Now, here's your host, John Furrier and Peter Burris. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are here live in San Francisco for Oracle Open World 2016. This is SiliconANGLE Media's The Cube, our flagship program, where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the co-CEO of SiliconANGLE Media. Here's my co-host, Peter Burris, head of research for SiliconANGLE Media, as well as the general manager of Wikibon Research. We have two venture capitalists here to tell us the real story, Greg Sands, the founder of Costa Noa VC, costanoavc.com, and Jim Wilson, operating partner, new to the firm. Uh, welcome to theCUBE, great to see you, Greg. It's great to see you, we're, we're thrilled to be here. Thank Jim, you. Good to see you, we saw each other Saturday at the Stanford USC game, you had a, 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 a big tailgate, kind of a you know, laid, laid back, you know, but you had the big screen TVs and watching the Alabama Ole Miss game, which is good. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You know you made it when you're having the big tailgates for the, for the VC firm, congratulations. <laughs> uh, Greg, you, um, been a great entrepreneur, I've known you personally, so full disclosure. Great operating person, because you've been at Netscape, the company for the young people out there don't know, Netscape is where Mark Andreessen and, and a bunch of Silicon Valley folks invented the browser, and then an enterprise got behind that, so you've been in tech, and then Sutter Hill Ventures went out four years ago to start mm -hmm. your own VC firm. That's right. Um, now very successful. Give us the update on the firm, how many partners, how many people, how much yeah, cash actually, you have left to write check? <laughs> Second fund, third fund, fifth fund, billion dollars, how much? Yeah, so uh, so uh, we started the firm in 2012, and uh, John and I were probably on the soccer sidelines <laughs> when all that happened, and we're talking shop, which was great. Uh, we're now, we're investing out of our second fund, which is a $135 million fund. We're entirely focused on seed and series A in enterprise technology, meaning data-driven applications and the infrastructure that supports them. We're now two partners, a principal, an associate. We've got uh, one venture partner, uh, Mark Selko, who was previously uh, co-founder and president of Merced Systems and of Baby Center. And we have two operating partners, uh, Martina Lachenko, focused on marketing, and Jim Wilson, focused on sales. And Jim, what's your background? Uh, so my background is uh, pure sales. I've been in a sales organization and had a quota in one uh, way or another for 25 years. Uh, I've been at uh, big companies through an acquisition. I've been at Microsoft. I've been at uh, enterprise, pretty en enterprise sales through an acquisition of a company called Groove Networks, which was an early collaboration oh, technology. Ozzie, uh, where yeah. I worked for Ray. Ray I worked for Ray. Yeah. Um, I worked at a company called Parametric Technology, now known as PTC, yeah. and uh, started out actually as a sales engineer, worked my way up, ran Asia for nine years for them, and uh, came back to the States and ran the West Coast as well. Uh, also, as Greg mentioned, was at Merced Systems. That's where I got to know Greg and the founders. And recently, I was at Sumo Logic, uh, which does machine data and analytics. Yeah, so you, you know the value of what's going on. Greg, you've been one of the smartest investors. We've talked, again, many times on the sidelines. And I want to get your take on this, because you're a smart investor. Again, a seed fund, so you're making early bets. So you have to dig in and kind of see the, the, the baby growing up, if you will, and understand the trajectory. Uh, but over the past four years, the enterprise has been gone from, ah, no one really does anything in the enterprise to, it's the hottest category, uh, certainly as the consumer unicorns start to kind of fade away or kind of just kind of settle in. Just to, just to tell a story, I was trying to raise fund one in the teeth of the Facebook IPO and I was trying to talk about the enterprise and LPs couldn't be bothered. I mean, we got <laughs> it done, but everybody thought that consumer and social media were the only things that mattered. Yeah, and then back then, storage, ah, storage is boring, center all the action. But the convergence, what Facebook showed mm -hmm. was, the hyperscales from the web scale guys showed the hyperconvergence in action. Right. People that were really writing the software saw that the hardware was going down to very low cost, but the performance was going to be in the software. But it's a hard business to get into. How, how, do you, how do you look at the investment thesis for your firm? Do you have a specific category? And what are the, some of the things that get your attention? Yeah, so we, uh, so, you know, we are investing anywhere from at formation to sometimes a company is two years old, has a million, you know, has product in market, has a million dollars of annual recurring revenue. So very early stage. Both Neil and I as partners are former product managers. So we think of ourselves as fundamentally making decisions about products and people. And then part of the reason that we built the operating infrastructure with Jim and sales and Martina and marketing is to help product-oriented founders then bring companies to market and focus on efficient market entry and, and, and scale up. And I would say we have, um, uh, you know, we have uh, three or four key things that we're focused on. 
Certainly one key part of that is SaaS and data-driven applications. And so obviously you see people like Oracle making big moves into the SaaS infrastructure. Uh, we've been, the venture industry has been doing it for, for 10 years these days. You know, we used to talk about data-driven applications, now machine learning uh, is really omnipresent and it really is being used in an application context. So that's certainly one area. Uh, there's another area which is that the, uh, the cloud infrastructure requires a degree of agility in infrastructure and so the DevOps movement. And so there are companies like VictorOps uh, which helps people with real-time incident management when developers and operations need to collaborate together. Uh, and uh, security and the data infrastructure are you know, sort of four key areas where we're spending a lot of our time and energy. So I was talking to Jerry Chen at Greylock, who you know, ex-VMware, again a product guy, CTO type, similar to yourself, and he um, did a class at Stanford with Reid Hoffman called Blitz Scaling, and really focused on consumer, which we all know there is a scale model where you know the 10 billion is a new 1 billion, 1 million, uh, 10 million is a new 1 million, where you can actually get rapid growth and hit a slipstream and grow like crazy. So I asked him the question, I'll ask you the same thing, is there a Blitz Scaling for the enterprise? Because it's not that easy especially with a lot of the technology change at the data center level and also in the cloud. Is there a formula, is there a kind of scale pattern that you see in the enterprise that entrepreneurs can look at to take advantage of with the big guys getting richer? IBM, EMC now, Dell Technologies, Oracle, just the well, rich so, team to get richer. Yeah. That might not bode well for the startups, or does it, does it matter? What's your thoughts? So I, uh, the, uh, I, I wrote a blog post that was tongue in cheek called uh, Blitz, or uh, tap on the brakes, I thought we were blitz scaling. <laughs> and so, of course, the blitz scaling course was launched in September of last year, just as we hit that first bump that let some air out of the markets. I mean, to me, blitz scaling is, a, um, is not only a consumer construct, but it's a bull market construct. Most of the time, enterprise things are, even very fast enterprise growth is uh, block by block. So you think about the old uh, Dylan song, Forever Young, right? May you build a ladder to the stars and climb on every rung. In enterprise, you got to climb on, any, in, on every rung. There isn't another way to do it. You can do it fast, but it's expensive to do it fast. So we've talked, we spent a bunch of time over the years talking about pure storage, which we incubated at Sutter Hill while I was there. That is blitz scaling for the enterprise. And they have done an excellent job. Well, they were laser it's, focused at the beginning. They were laser sure. focused, but once they found product market fit and had first product in market, they went as fast as you can possibly go in the enterprise, and I think have executed extraordinarily well in doing it. So is but that it's a, extremely expensive. Was there a method to their man? I talked to Scott when early on too as well. Again, again, he never wavered. He always said all flash storage, that's the future. He never wavered off that. But did the market spin in their direction? Was it the EMCs declining innovation around VMAX and some of these technologies? Did they actually know the beachhead that they were targeting when they entered the market? Because they had real rapid growth mm -hmm. right at the beginning. A lot of it at the expense of some of the older storage vendors. Is that kind of by design? Is that kind of the pattern that you guys recommend startups to take? Kind of well, take your advantage and get a nice winning uh, position early? So I think, and, and, and I'll well, you point out, you know, again, Mike Spicer at Sutter Hill was the lead and, and, and always has been there, but the, it's, uh, they had a clear view of the technology trends and the opportunity that the incumbents were, uh, were leaving on the table. And I think that part was really clear. They had a clear focus on, I think, the high IOPS environments. And so basically that there was going to be an opportunity for, um, for the greatest scale applications outside of the top three or four consumer companies which have effectively become systems vendors themselves. And I, but I think they also discovered one or two adjacencies that they didn't anticipate that they could um, the virtual desktop environment, for example, I don't think was as high on their list uh, as it came out to be, and has been a really critical so environment that, for them. So, yeah, that worked out in there. Okay, let's go SaaS, so big data. Um, we heard Larry Ellison in his keynote Sunday night um, say, we have a data cloud. Now, that's the first time I've actually heard his term data cloud. I heard database as a service, but they have all this data from human resource management stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Do you see big data analytics being an industry specific? Is there an advantage for a startup to have data well, absolutely. in a cloud-like yeah. way? Absolutely, and the or Oracle Data Cloud, interestingly, is, uh, so it really is the combination of two big acquisitions, the biggest of which was Datalogix, where we were an investor and, and sold it to them. 
and 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 a blue kai. And so the integration of those two products is the data cloud, and it's largely was that, Sutter or, uh, that was uh, that was a, that was a Cosino investment. Actually, it was both. Data Logics. Data Logics was. Okay. Yeah, so that was oh, our first opportunity to send money back home to our investors, and <laughs> and and we, and we and appreciate secures that. And secures the second fund. Yes, <laughs> uh, uh, every bit helps. <laughs> and so. Uh, so, so there, they're really uh, what they're re really focused on uh, as a large marketing cloud provider, having the not so much the data infrastructure, but the data from all of their customers and the data aggregated and cleansed and deduped, so that they can basically be the market maker and the broker for data enrichment for everyone within the Oracle CRM experience. And actually, they've done a great job, and arguably they have done the best job in terms of creating that set of data assets. The other big marketing cloud providers, Salesforce and Adobe, uh, have not yet made nearly as bold a move. And I would say that Microsoft, who uh, Microsoft's purchase of LinkedIn, really is a move into the data cloud. That's what they were really trying to do, more than buy a media property. I totally agree. Now, but let's let's talk about this because the uh, historically, when we were bringing software to processes that everybody had, it was how fast can you do that? What kind of technology you're going to use? The minute you start talking about data and engagement, especially customer engagement. People got to start being a little bit more concerned about letting those crucial assets out the door. So how are these companies going to be able to both protect their customers at the same time monetize those data assets in a public way? Absolutely, and I think, by the way, it's a significant challenge for all of the marketing cloud providers, totally. and I think uh, Salesforce actually made the first move in that regard in buying Jigsaw, and ultimately found that the terms of service that they had with customers didn't work right. as it was inside the Salesforce family. Right. And so I think the notion that says um, the place that these folks are, really all three of them are going to have to end up, is to say we have the opportunity for uh, aggregated data assets to enrich your customers, to enrich your customer experience, to enrich your experience of using the software, but you can opt into it or not. The software will actually work better if you're, at, if you're willing to integrate and aggregate your data, but we're not going to take your data and sell it to your competitor, so they're going to have to be clear firewalls and delineations about how it can be used, both to protect the customer and to protect the end user. So I know you guys are looking at, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're looking at some of the new machine learning and some mm -hmm. of the new data-driven applications. Yes. Uh, and everybody talks about how automation is going to get rid of people, and we'll see how that plays out. But there's one area that I find particularly interesting, and that is, if I'm a vendor selling a data-driven application with machine learning attributes, it's promising a service that's going to do predictive types of stuff. Why wouldn't my first move be to discount another vendor's predictive application? How does a customer ensure that their predictive applications aren't competing with each other in presenting the best next action? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll give you a couple of uh, a couple of good examples. So we've got a, uh, a company called Guardian Analytics, which does fraud prevention for banks using machine learning. And there are 425 banks that are on the platform. There is shared data, and as a result, the uh, you, you've got better data uh, across platform, across bank, and the algorithms learn faster and prevent fraud better. That's a case where these banks. They may on the margin compete against each other for an individual consumer, but they actually all have a vested interest right. in preventing fraud. And they're overtly, overtly agreeing to share the data uh, uh, for the mm -hmm. benefit of the better trillion dollar problem. That's right. Like right. insurance Absolutely. companies are willing to share actuarial data to get better actuarial that's right. tables. That's right, and so that's not every application, but that, that is, a, is, a, is a great example. I do think in the, in the marketing ecosystem, there is a, um, there's a, you know, if a individual customer, an e-commerce company, is trying to decide, am I going to take my data and sell it into Blue Kai, sell it into the Oracle Data Cloud? Do I get enough value for doing it? That's probably question number one. The second is, can I go and take the five people that are in my category and say, you can't sell it to them, you can't use it 
to make their business performance better. But I'm okay if you've got auto manufacturers or people selling toothpaste or other, or, you know, CPG companies who are using it in aggregated So policy-based data sharing is That's a right. category. It, but it's and, you, and, you, it's, and, it's, and it's critically important. Yeah. But it's got to be tied back to some notion of data value, and that's still a long ways off. Um, let me ask you, on the sales side, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're observing, and we've had a couple conversations like this in the queue, we're observing that Hadoop, Spark, big data, it's a lot of downloads, not as much going into production. Mm -hmm. So bear with me, I'm not going to ask you specifically yeah, about the no technology. Yeah. But that there has been a presumption that open source was going to work as well for big data as it worked for, say, Linux. Yeah. Now the difference is, I was st there was a huge marketplace yeah. for of very, very smart, sophisticated Linux administrators right. that are more than happy to underwrite the cost of understanding what Linux was. Right. There's a very, very different class of user a lot of these big data technologies, they're not as sophisticated, yet arguably the technologies that they're being shown are far more complex than you get in an operating system. Right. Right. Are sales guys going to become more or less relevant as we try to match complex use cases, complex technologies, to companies that are learning how to use them? You know, I, I think uh, the one constant I've seen, at least in the last 10 years, is that you're always going to need a sales organization in one uh, shape or form. I think the question is around what level and what's your sales motion. So I see a lot of companies, and Sumo Logic was a great example of that, with multiple routes to market, that are trying to tackle different problems. They have an, inter or an enterprise rep that's focusing on more larger, multi-buyer sales cycles, and then for the smaller SMB companies, they have an inside sales team. I think the big challenge, especially as it relates to open source, is the companies need to figure out how to monetize that, and as that relates to salespeople, salespeople need to understand how they're going to be properly quoted in gold and make money in commission. And I think that's a big challenge for any open source company today. You know, one of the things that I'd, that I'd say to that is, particularly in a startup ecosystem, if you're Oracle, you might be able to get away with it. But we all know that the buyer's journey, whether it's open source or SaaS, most, half of that, maybe more, is happening before a sales rep ever talks to a customer. That's true. So the requirement for product experience, download experience, self-provisioning experience, pilots, demos with, with live data are critically important. And then most often, I think salespeople are inter intersecting with a customer farther down the funnel than they would have 10 years ago. When, you know, 10 years ago, a salesperson was calling on somebody and explaining the product to them from first principles, and now the customer's like, yeah, I've already downloaded, I'm trying, I'm using it. The question is, how am I going to use it? Can you help me figure out how I'm going to integrate it with other things? How does it, is it the single best way to solve the problem that I'm working on? Greg, I want to ask you a question, it's just we have limited time, I want to get this out there, because you mentioned the bank sharing data to get the massive upside on the fraud, which is trillions brings up the notion of how uh, we're living in today's environment of mobile and engagement data. Yeah. And I know you have a lot of background with, with some portfolio companies, mm -hmm. past and present, that are in marketing. Mm -hmm. And so account-based marketing is the rage right now. So I can all hear yeah. account-based marketing. But yet I hear people say, well, we don't want to go into the lead gen capturing people. And in fact, we don't even want to ask them questions. We actually have them have the freemium engagement, free content, because we're instrumenting new types of engagement. I'd much rather know who the person is, not the company. In most forms today, they want to know, first type in the company, not who right. you are. Right. CEO, CTO. Do you see the balance shifting between account-based which seems to be a database feature, less of a human feature? Well, so, uh, so we, and we actually have two investments that are in and around account-based marketing. Demand-based, which is the bigger and more mature company, right. ZenIQ, which is a, a, a newer upstart uh, going after it with a slightly different angle. And I'll point out that, uh, that demand base in particular is the Oracle Marketing Cloud's main partner for account-based marketing. So we're, you know, we love working with them and they've been a great partner to us. And I think it depends on, you, I think you actually want both. You want to know if- Because persona data lets you move around If you're selling storage, you want to know whether someone's a storage buyer. Right. On the other hand, if you are selling to Citibank or Procter & Gamble or Exxon, 
it's an enterprise sale and it's a multi constituent sale. It's not sale. mutually exclusive. It's not mutually exclusive. Right. You still, you, there are multiple. You're selling into a community. You're selling into a community. You want coverage so. across that community. In the, in the long run, you're going to have to touch IT, a business buyer, a technical decision maker, finance, legal, procurement, and you actually want to have an orchestrated approach to talk to them all. And so that, so account-based marketing is really, it's more, it's more relevant if you're selling to enterprise rather than mid-market, but when you've got complex sale, you absolutely need to take, the, the, the notion that those five people are all treated as individual atomic units, and you're selling to each of them, you're not. Yeah. You're trying to take an or, a well-orchestrated campaign. It depends on how you're looking at the problem. Yeah. But open data means you want to get as much data as possible. That's right. If that fits persona better, and then you can come and take a much more account-based, I totally get that. Yeah. We kind of like to frame the problem as an inbound problem, how do you get found and have your brand, and an outbound problem, and account-based marketing really solves more of the outbound problem, but you need both to be successful as you grow. All right guys, final question for you. Greg, talk about the kind of hot deals you're looking at. You know, you got guys coming in, doing, giving a lot of pitches, you say a lot of no's, but you do say yes, you're writing checks. Um, what are some of the hot areas that are on your radar that are getting you excited right now? And 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 vis-a-vis -vis Oracle and their move to the cloud because it's daunting for an entrepreneur. Like, do you hear people come in and say, I, I want to take down Oracle? Do you yeah. hear that pitch, or, or I want to come in and, and dry, ride with them on their journey? Well, or fill a white space? Or is there, maybe I, I a better question: What's the white space? Yeah. So yeah. so there are. Um, by the way, we're completely willing to do both, right? As I said, we got a great partnership I mean, with them. And your storage, I want to take down EMC. That's that was right. A bold statement. And so you know we have. Sold them data logics. We're working with them at demand base on our marketing cloud. Uh, they just bought NetSuite, and so you know we're investors in Intact, and so we're willing to compete with them, uh, and we welcome them to that space, and and that I think will be a, continue to be a good battle. Uh, but I'll tell you, most of the time we're actually more focused on technology and the customer problem. And so here's a great example. Uh, the, the clearly containers are one of the really interesting trends in and around the infrastructure category. And so we've all been looking at containers. Containers are largely an open source technology, yeah. right? So the question of uh, how are you going to make money, build an income statement, even if, you know, certainly if you're not Docker, how are you going to do it? And so we, we've been um, really excited to find places where you can use container containers in a containerized infrastructure. And we found one in a company called App Orbit, which is around in and around the DevOps ecosystem for Dev and Test. So you can think of it in some ways as virtual lab manager, but rather than using a virtual uh, a uh, VM infrastructure, using a containerized infrastructure, it's a technology technological tour de force. But it solves a customer problem in and around the Dev, dev and Test ecosystem. It's a nice white space with room to grow. White Very space much. with room to grow, with great people, okay. and we will do that all day all right, long. So let, tell me the white spaces that you see, you guys see out there. For entrepreneurs who are watching, they're like, they just, a lot, the number one question I get from entrepreneurs, where's the white space? They're looking for some insight. Any, any you could share. White spaces that are good targets for entrepreneurs to go after. And they, they might have some technology, you might not have heard it from them yet, but where can they attack well, some so, nice white spaces? So I think uh, the, I think the SaaS ecosystem is actually ready for second generation companies that are built around data and machine learning. So that's certainly one. I think there are, uh, the pervasiveness of enterprise mobile is opening up new application categories that weren't categories before uh, field-oriented workers had a smart device in their hands. So those are two things that we're working a lot on. I think uh, agility and in infrastructure is absolutely critical and, uh, and therefore there are new problems that the dev platforms and the DevOps yeah. infrastructure is creating. <laughs> and, and exactly. And so, and by, by the way, we just made our first uh, investment in and around uh, drones for use in very specific industrial purposes. So to me, the, the technology that you can bring to bear on these business and enterprise problems is, uh, is really extraordinary. And therefore, the challenge for a technology entrepreneur is to say, where is that business problem that I attach to, to go solve it. And that's the piece that I would encourage them to take that technology and assemble it and bring it to bear to solve yeah. a very specific business problem. I saw a great Facebook video called drone surfing. It's going to be the new hot trend. You basically, the drone carries you out instead of kite surfing, new trend. <laughs> right. so, well, hey, but, and so for us, I mean, we're, we're, we're geeks, right? So, yeah, you know, we're excited about you being the back end software that drones use 
uh, for, for to do the visual analysis and volumetric analysis for industrial applications. So that's the kind of stuff that we get so excited about. So are you straying, about. is it off, not, not off the reservation to look at some sort of physics play that's got some technology that might be uh, energy related to the data center or software that power drones that syncs up with the power grid? That would not be off the radar screen. That's okay. We'd be, yeah. All right, so, I mean, she made that up. Sounded good. Yeah, company on that. you no. should start that company. <laughs> <laughs> on the queue. Final question, how much cash do you have left in fund two? I know you saved some for investment follow yeah. on. How much dry powder do you have left? Yeah, we're probably two thirds of the way through the fund two investment cycle. So uh, it was raised in the in the uh, middle of 2014. So, so a few more checks to write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll make uh, you know, but we expect to be steadily and constantly in market. We our LPs are excited about what we're doing, and we're going to be continuing to fund execute. three in the horizon. You can't really talk about that because yeah. you can't quiet period. But is the, that, that um, the rule. Uh, we're not actively doing it, so I don't think there's any regs against it. But the the main point is, um, you know, we are expect to, you know, we expect to be doing what we're doing yeah. for many years in the future. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your great success. Great to see you, Costanova VC, uh, one of the best VCs. Really focused, not the big fund, but they're doing a lot of great investments. Check them out if you haven't seen them. This is the Cube live here in Moscone, in San Francisco. In San Francisco, I'm John Furrier with Peter Burris. You're watching the Cube. <laughs>